at the, at the at the end of the phenomenology of spirit that Hegel wrote with the master slave discourse and everything, uh, he does go into um, interpreting Christianity along the lines of this model of self consciousness, uh, which you know did seem to influence Schleiermacher quite a bit. And I think you know again simplifying things, Schleiermacher is a little I think at least for me, a little bit easier to get a handle on exactly what he's saying. And so I want to kind of lean on Schleiermacher as kind of a simplification of Hegel's understanding of theology. Um, and let's just kind of blend these things together. Again, this could be a corruption, you know, for the for the uh, purist, um, but I'm just trying to get a rough idea uh, in our mind of, of, of what's going on here in this philosophy. And now, um, Hegel then later on uh, is giving lectures on the philosophy of history. And of course, being a philosophy professor, he was giving lectures on the history of philosophy, like I'm doing a history of modern philosophy. But as he does that, he begins to think about the very notion of history itself. What do we mean by history? And, um, and so, uh, this is, it's really in, in this uh, philosophy of history that Marx gets his inspiration. Because, you know, we've, we've been, uh, you know, I've emphasized in the study of Marx that it's about historical materialism. What is meant by historical materialism from a Marxist perspective is a reworking of Hegel's philosophy of history. Okay. Um, and so let's look at Hegel's version of history. Now, um, if we think in Schleiermacher's terms that the individual person is kind of a microcosm, uh, mind and body as the person that acts in the world, but is a reflection of the universal uh, mind, matter, you know, person uh, of God. Um, and again, thinking in Leibnizian terms where God is like the, the chief monad and then everybody is, is connected in some kind of hierarchy. And then there's like extraordinary individuals. Um, and Hegel really attaches onto this idea that there are extraordinary individuals, world historic figures, as he likes to call them, um, who embody the spirit of the world, the spirit of the universe, God, more so than other people. And so they're like higher up in the Leibnizian hierarchy of monads. And uh, now one experience that he had right at the time that the phenomenology of spirit was being published is the Battle of Jena. And Jena is where, is where Hegel and Schleiermacher taught, is in the city of Jena. And there was this major battle there between Napoleon and Frederick William III of Prussia. So this is the, uh, the great, great grandson, the, the, no, the great grandson, right? This is the, yes, the great grandson uh, of Frederick the Great that I talked about before in connection to Napoleon. And so you have the, the great grandson of Frederick the Great now going to battle against Napoleon on the battlefield. And in, and in Jena, this, this happened like outside of the city and many people fled, but, but they were very, they're very closely connected to the blow by blow um, breakdown of, of the, the battle, and especially as it was discussed after the fact. And Napoleon roundly defeats uh, 
uh, Frederick William III. And this is really the end of, of the glory of Frederick the Great. Um, Napoleon totally subsumes Prussia into the French Empire. And that, and that talking of subsuming, uh, you know, is really important here because what the way that Hegel sees it is that Napoleon has demonstrated himself as a world historic figure that could take over the spirit, like subsume and, and consume the, the spirit of Frederick the Great and show him to be a world historic figure like Fred, Frederick the Great. And so he idealized both these guys. And in this battle, which happened in his hometown, in Hegel's hometown, it, you know, he sees like this world historic moment and he sees Napoleon as like rising up in the ranks of the Leibnizian hier hierarchy of, of monads. And, uh, you know, he really begins to idealize Napoleon, as many people did at this point. And, you know, Hegel's not unusual. Like, there were, uh, Napoleon had lots of propaganda about liberating people, you know, based on the slogans of the French Revolution and, and everything like that, and this liberalism that he did embody. Uh, but, um, but then as it drags on and Napoleon becomes more of a nuisance on, uh, you know, people change their attitude and what he starts out as a big hero and eventually they're like, we got to get rid of this Napoleon guy. He's just uh, monomaniacal. He won't, he won't stop. Um, you know, uh, Napoleon begins to be seen as a kind of Hitler figure uh, at the, by the end of his reign, where ultimately everyone allies against him. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, Hitler then in many ways was the propaganda around Hitler was to idealize him as a kind of second coming of Napoleon. Um, and there are, you know, similar characteristics where everybody's very enthusiastic at the beginning, but then as it gets deeper and deeper, it's like, this guy's, this guy's crazy. Um, and so uh, Hegel went through that, but this did very much influence his understanding of history. And he, he never let go of that idea of these world historic figures and even Napoleon, although it wasn't as glorious as he first uh, believed it to be. Uh, nonetheless, Napoleon did demonstrate himself as a world historic figure. He is displaying dominance. And that's some kind of spiritual dominance in Hegel's thinking, because he's never, he's never d detaching himself from this Leibnizian hierarchy uh, of monads. He's just now, he's just overcome Cartesian mind-body dualism uh, in a way that, that incorporates empiricism where Leibniz didn't do that. Leibniz is always arguing against empiricism, but Hegel never gets rid of that hierarchy of monads. Um, <clears throat> and uh, now there, now he makes several distinctions uh, in these lectures and, and these were just lectures so the the writings we have are from Hegel's own written notes for his lecture lectures and then the notes of students who took notes during his lectures and those were edited together um, to make a coherent uh, work um, and and often uh, it's suggested to students to read uh, the lectures on the history on the philosophy of history first because it, it helps to make sense of what Hegel's saying, uh, even back in the phenomenology. And I, I think that's true. I mean, that's the way I did it because I took that suggestion. Um, um, so he, he makes a distinction about written history. You know, there's the history that's written in the in the history books. Um, and he distinguishes several different kinds of history and uh, the, you know, and there is like the, the kind of history you see in a textbook and, 
and, you know, these lower forms of history, uh, historiography that are, that Hegel sees as not as authentic, but the most authentic is what he calls originary history, where you have people writing who are very close to the subject matter, that are writing history in the time that the history is happening. And they're, and they're writing with a view to the future and trying to explain to the future what is happening in their own day. Um, and, and of course we get people like Herodotus, who's the person who uh, coined the term history, which just means like story in Greek. And so he told his story, his narrative um, in, in Athens. And that's the beginning of Western historiography. Uh, is with Herodotus, and then after him comes Thucydides, which is another of these originary historians. And these, this is the kind of classic model of history. And so Hegel is very much reinforcing this classical view of history, uh, Eurocentric, you know, philosophical, embedded in ancient Athens, uh, all these sort of things that, of course, Ducell is going to is going to criticize. Um, And so originary history is, is the most authentic. And the Battle of Jena now makes Hegel's description of originary history, historiography, then makes Hegel with his, his personal experience of the Battle of Jena, a sort of originary philosophy of history. Uh, because he's writing about the phenomena of Fred Frederick the Great and Napoleon and trying to explain to the future how this is the unfolding of uh, a world history, a spirit of world history. Okay, so, and, and, and that's the thing is that the world history on Hegel's view is controlled, uh, you know, dominated, mastered by a spirit uh, but of course, um, and so like there is mind body, there is mind like the mind of God and the world. And, and of course, the mind of God does not exist in space or time, but the world exists within space and time and unfolds through time. And that's what history is. But that unfolding through time is merely the self-contemplation of the entelechy of God unfolding in its physical manifestation and in its, in its material aspect, um, to use the Aristotelian formulation. And so, uh, and of course, what, now, what's different about Hegel here, and this is very significant, is that for Leibniz and for Aristotle, the world would be a kind of effortless uh, unfolding of the entelechy of God, just always reflecting this perfection which God is. But for Hegel, God is going through the master-slave discourse. Just like, just as we, as, as you, as an individual person, in a Schleiermacherian kind of way of thinking, just like you are a microcosm of God, and you need to go, according to Hegel, through the master-slave discourse and come to this higher state of consciousness, of self-consciousness, so does God. That God was not always as self-conscious as he is now, but of course God doesn't exist in time. So, so it is, that in, that in one aspect, God is perfect, but, the historical working out of God's spirit 
is a progress from a kind of imperfection towards the entelechy perfection, which is the mind aspect of God. But God is the universe and the mind aspect. Um, hopefully that, that kind of makes sense. Um, and so, and so just like in as a person, we have to live through life and we have to mature. And part of what Hegel sees as uh, a high level of maturity is to go through the master slave discourse and reach a higher state of consciousness. So too, God in, in the history of the world is going through a self-reflective, um, better understanding of themselves and uh and working towards a a better state so then this comes off as a kind of theodicy why is there evil in the world because the evil that we see in the world and remember theodicy is to explain the problem of evil going back to leibniz and his theodicy um the evil that exists in the world today is a manifestation of God's struggle with himself to become fully self-conscious. And, but God is becoming more fully self-conscious. And as he does, um, freedom and liberty is being spread throughout the world as we experience in time, God's perfection of self-consciousness which even, even for God has to go through logically, though not in time, the mind of God has to go through the master-slave discourse, but then the physical aspect of the universe is an unfolding of that in a time sequence which reflects to the logic of the master-slave discourse. And so evil is only a temporary thing and the world is moving to a sort of perfection where God will fully realize in history the absolute freedom that is the uh, is an essential part of the uh, the being of God, and we will all experience because we're all in a Spinozian way we're all uh, really wrapped up in God. God is the master monad, and we're all really living inside of God, both spiritually and physically. Uh, and so as God becomes more self-conscious, reflected in history, uh, in that aspect of history, the world becomes more free. And, and Napoleon is a key progress uh, step in that direction. Mar, you know, and the big thing we can hold on to is the Napoleonic Code, which rationalized the legal system throughout all of Europe through, you know, through, through uh, Napoleon's conquest. Um, okay. And so he does see history as progressing and getting better because history is a, 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 a progression towards a better state because it's merely the reflection of God's self-consciousness going through the, the master-slave discourse. Okay. Um, and so that's what real history is. Apart from written history, real philosophical history is this in unfolding of the self-consciousness of God. Okay. Um, hopefully that makes some sense. And, and of course, I can always uh, answer questions, uh, you know, on any of this stuff. Uh, but I think that's, I think that's good enough for us for this. Um, that's probably like the hardest, the hardest uh, thing in this whole discussion. Hegel is, Hegel is often left out of a discussion of modern history and then kind of left out of the discussion entirely because it is difficult to explain. He's difficult to explain, uh, but that was my, my best shot. Okay. 